this deadline of 300 million vaccines by January of 2021. Dr. Fauci, America's Commandant of Science, which is his official title, <laughs> has said that he is willing to forego testing and trials. I'm, yeah, like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Like, that's like, that's like fucking somebody in an Applebee's bathroom because they rubbed up against you at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now everybody's gonna get sick because nobody took the time to do things properly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I did mention kids should probably not <laughs> come to the show. <laughs> I think you said that. <laughs> I, I hope I did. <laughs> but look, I understand vaccines are a very controversial topic, right? We're, we're facing a, 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 an era in our society where there are people who are against the idea of vaccine uh, and they're called anti-vaxxers, right? They have taken to the internet to make bold statements about how vaccines can cause a bunch of other diseases and even death, which we don't have a cure for. <laughs> Not sure if you know this, but I was very surprised to find that in my research that we haven't figured out how to cure that shit. <laughs>
think, right? What What is the psychology of a person like this? Why would someone make these claims against vaccines that have prevented the spread of so many diseases like measles and rubella and other diseases that kind of sound like vegetables you put on a nice summer salad? <laughs> 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 they do, right? I feel like one day yeah. we're gonna be like, this is broccolitis. It's like, wow, the kids were right. <laughs> kids were right. The broccoli's gonna kill you. <laughs> <laughs> you <know? laughs> but before we dive into all of that, I do want to say uh, that going forward, I am gonna uh, refer to these folks as vaccine deniers instead of <laughs> anti-vaxxers. Right? Because with the prefix like anti and the double X in their name, it just kind of sounds like they're the epidemiologists of the Legion of Doom. <laughs> <laughs> and look, that's not fair to Lex Luthor, who is the CEO of the Legion, okay? <laughs> he would definitely be on the forefront of developing a vaccine, and he would probably deliver it for free as long as we give him the Kryptonian menace. <laughs> Which, thanks to Zack Snyder, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. <laughs> that joke might be for like two people in here. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm saying is the Snyder cut is not going to be good and there's no vaccine for that. So <laughs> there's no way to fix that trap. <laughs> Anyway, now look, most vaccine deniers are prone to looking at only the negatives and they overestimate risk, right? They're prone to, they're prone to be negative Nancys and overestimating Olivers. <laughs> I don't know if that's a thing, but I'm making it a thing. <laughs> <laughs> like for example, right? If a, if a child gets vaccinated, and then unfortunately passes away from the stroke, they automatically associate the fact that the vaccine is the cause of the child's death instead of asking what other factors could be at play, right? What's the family's medical history? Were there any other complications with the, with the child's conditions, right? Did the child's parents fuck in an Applebee's bathroom <laughs> and learning that information was the root cause of the stroke. <laughs> what is the sex appeal of an Applebee's? Should we as a society shut down all Applebee's or we'll stop fucking inside of them? Very <laughs> now, with this overestimation in mind, we do have to realize that most human beings are shit at statistics, right? <laughs> it's a scientific term, you guys. Okay, 48% of us know this. Look, a lot of us are more concerned about coconuts falling on our head and shark attacks than we are driving into work. All of those things have an equal chance of death. <laughs> yeah. And I have to remind you, we still don't have a cure for death, you guys. We don't know how to do it.
All right, everybody. Hello. Hello, 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 and welcome to the program. Uh, hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys had a good weekend. I know I didn't I didn't do a stream yesterday because uh, I was in Cleveland doing uh, doing a, a show that turned out to be kind of a, a weird show. Uh, so I want to do a quick check in. I already see some folks commenting in, in the uh, in in a couple of the comment sections, uh, and that's that's fine. We're gonna get into the stories of the day uh, here in just a few moments, and I'll and I'll make a little disclaimer before we jump into that. Uh, I do want to talk about a couple of uh, things. I want a, a big shout out to everybody that came out to the fun house uh, in Pittsburgh. On Sunday, uh, I got a chance to open for Ben Roy and Off With Their Heads, and that was a really, really cool show, really great show, really great crowd. Uh, I had a blast on that show, so uh, a, a big shout-out to everybody that came out to that, and big shout-out to Off With Their Heads and Ben Roy for for having me uh, on that show. It was, it was really, really rad uh, to, to be a part of that show. Very cool band, super funny comedian, so check them out if they are coming to your neck of the woods uh which i believe that they are uh well i, I don't i don't know where you i don't want to say that they are and then you live in like kalamazoo and they then they're not coming there so uh they, they might be coming to your neck of the woods check, check out their tour dates uh i do have a bunch of live shows i put up some tickets for um uh, august 14th in pittsburgh september 17th in williamsport september 30th in louisville October 6th in Lansing and October 8th in Detroit. Uh, I am adding more dates, so hopefully there there will be a few more dates uh, that that I can share with you guys, and I'll be coming to different cities and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com uh, for, uh, for tickets and details and all that fun stuff. That's where that's going to be. I did uh, reschedule my virtual show uh, from this past Friday. The July 30th show has been rescheduled to August 13th, Friday, August 13th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I guess it's 5 p.m. Pacific if I got my time zones correct. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it, so if you're if you're interested in seeing the, the full hour before I start performing it uh, live, then that is the that is the place to go. Uh, I've got uh, more dates that I'm confirming as we speak. And lastly, I want to uh, just give you guys a heads up that at the end of the month, I'll be, I'm going to take two weeks off from from live streaming and putting up podcasts and all that sort of stuff, uh, just because I need a break. Uh, I'm going to need to take a little bit of a break, a little bit of a hiatus. I'm still going to be like working on new content, putting up new fork full of noodles. Um, and and all that sort of stuff but uh live streams are probably not going to happen podcast is not going to happen i might throw up a couple of short videos about you know breaking news and that sort of stuff but uh i've got a couple other projects i'd like to kick off and work on and just focus on a little bit of rest that's that's something that i uh, i think i need uh especially with all of the craziness that's been going on um personally and like just career wise, just work wise, uh, with shows coming back and and all that's all that all that really good stuff. But it's just it's also just a little bit extra work to do, and you know there's always stress that is involved with booking shows. So that's gonna happen at the end of uh, end of this month, so the last two weeks of August. No live streams and all that sort of stuff. So um, let's dive into it. There's only one topic that I want to discuss today. And I know there's probably going to be people that are going to disagree with me that aren't going to like uh, what what I have to say, and that's fine. Uh, if you disagree with me and you don't like what I have to say, that's totally cool. Don't be a dick in the comment sections. Don't start an argument with people. If you guys have differing opinions, that's completely fine. If you guys are going to attack each other in the comment sections, I'm going to either trash your comment or, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to ignore all of that kind of stuff. Uh, this is this debate is not about whether you are pro vaccination or anti vaccination. It is about a completely different set of topics. Uh, and it's coming from a a uh, a trained epidemiologist, an interview with a trained epidemiologist who has talked about this sort of stuff on uh, World Socialist website. 
uh, so, uh, it, you know, that's that's I want to put that disclaimer out there. If you're going to be a dick in the comment sections, I have no interest in reading your comments. I have no interest in engaging uh, in the conversation. So just a fair warning, um, you know, and uh, uh, I will I will trash your comment if you're going to be if you're going to be an asshole. That's just the way that it's got to be, unfortunately. Uh, of course, somebody is trying to give me a phone call right at the right right at the start of all these right at the start of, of my stream. Anyway, um, so yeah, so that's that's a little heads up. Um, I'm 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 sure well, there's going to be a few people that aren't going to see eye to eye with me, and that's fine. So let's dive in. So um, this is a this is a, a two part interview. That Holly, who's in the comment section, sent uh, sent me the articles, uh, which thank you very much, by the way. That was uh, very, 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 very kind of you, and and it always uh, it always helps when when folks send me some stuff that I can read and and dig into and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so uh, this is an interview with Dr. Deepthi Gurdasani, who is uh, an epidemiologist and a machine learning expert, which basically means that she is very good at citing trends and looking at. Uh, looking at, you know, the cause of problems and things of that sort. And so she has a background in, in you know, by epidemiology and virology and that sort of stuff. And she's, it's a, it's a really well written article. It's a really well done interview. And uh, I recommend that if you guys, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go over every single little thing that she has said in the interview. Uh, I would recommend that you guys go read the articles, uh, uh, you know, and, and check it out for yourself and see what you get out of it. I'm going to talk about what I got out of it. Um, and the, you know, the important uh, things uh, or rather things that are important to me that was discussed in the article. And I will say that, you know, she this the things that she has expressed is probably this. This is probably the the person that is, um, you know, closest to a, a lot of the things that I believe in in regards to this subject. So uh, that's part of the reason why I was like th th this was kind of a refreshing thing to see. Uh, and, and she was able to articulate some stuff probably way better than I can. So um, we she starts talking about herd immunity, and this was really discussed quite quite heavily in the very beginning of uh, of the pandemic. I remember in March and April there were a lot of articles coming out about whether herd immunity is the way to move forward, considering you know we are so distant from getting any sort of vaccination. Um, which for all intents and purposes is, is how you get rid of viruses, how you stop pandemics, how you stop, you know, major diseases from spreading around the world. It's happened several times throughout history. Right. Um, so we were, I think they were in March, they were saying 12 to 18 months away from, uh, developing a vaccine that they could then, uh, mass manufacture and, and, you know, uh, send out to the rest of the world, um, and so that was a long time. Form of a lockdown for 12 to 18 months, uh, you know, and, and we couldn't get through two weeks of it. Uh, it was it was going to be very doubtful that human beings were able to do the quarantine thing for that long. Um, so this herd immunity argument started uh, being discussed, right? And uh, I looked into it. I was I was interested in what they had to say. And, and at the at the beginning of it, I was like, maybe this is the way to go. You know, I, I don't I don't know. I don't I don't I don't have any answers to what's going on. But this theory seems to be pretty interesting. Uh, and a lot of the a lot of the articles and theories say that, you know, the 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 best way and the and, and the, the right way to kind of achieve herd immunity in any any situation is a vaccine. And to do it with that one would be would be irresponsible, right? So I was kind of wondering, hey, can we do this without a vaccine and still be responsible, you know, without seeing a death toll and so on and so forth? So I'll, I'll get into that aspect of it a little bit. Uh, but she goes into like how uh, herd immunity was first talked about and stuff. And it, and it comes from like the farming world uh, and animal husbandry, right? Which, you know, animal husbandry, it, the, it, it, the conservatives were right, man. OK, you let the gays get married and look at this. Bam. We got we got people turning animals into husbands. All right. They're fucking. That's what that that's that's what the agenda has been all about, man. Fucking turning animals into husbands. 
What about animals wifery? Where where's that progressives? Huh? All right, we're done with that character. Uh, I, I I want uh, that's just a dumb joke that I wanted to throw in there because I thought it was dumb and fun. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the idea of herd immunity though is is to to reach a, a level of immunity within the within the population uh, that prevents and stops the spread of of what it, the virus or uh, you know bacteria or, or whatever the contagion is. The, that's that's sort of the general gist of it. And usually, you know, some of the stuff that I was reading, uh, they were saying like 60 percent of the population has to be inoculated or or build some kind of resistance to uh, to the contagion. So uh, so that that was an interesting theory. Right. Now, in order to achieve this without any kind of vaccination would be very difficult, especially for um, for SARS-CoV-2, right, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. It, it, it would be incredibly difficult, uh, and it would take a lot of effort and a lot of collective work to make something like this happen. So what would you need, right? And, and I think Sweden was kind of talking about this uh, early on as well, is uh, you would you would need an incredibly highly organized and highly efficient medical system. Uh, so hospital system, uh, setting up triage centers. And, you know, one of the arguments that I kept hearing was, well, now people can't go to the doctor. We're not catching things early. You know, uh, what if you have a heart murmur and you don't know and you get a heart attack and, you know, you can't go to the hospital because of because they're only taking COVID patients and emergency patients because their name, the, the rates and numbers are so high. What do we do? Well, you know, if you had a highly organized and very efficient medical system, you could set up a triage center. Um, you could find different resources, right? Like places, cert certain places are shut down. Certain places can't operate during this pandemic. So you turn those into triage centers uh, and, and that would be one way to treat them. But then you also have to have aftercare facilities, right? So after the two weeks to make sure that people are recovering properly um, so that they don't go back out and, and catch it again and then spread it again, right? Um, now, again, in, in order to make something like this work without vaccines, the entire community or, or the entire nation would have to have this shared goal in mind, that shared goal being that we want to curb this thing. We want to, to, to get rid of this thing. So, you know, and, and this would also, this idea was kind of popularized because it wouldn't sacrifice the economy, right? It would, quote, sacrifice the economy. People would still get to go out and do certain things. We might have to put, we would likely have to put some social distancing rules in place um, and so on and so forth, right? And, and at that point, it was very optional to wear masks and things of that sort. So with that in mind, I know Sweden tried this, but at the end of their thing, you know, I mean, uh, what is it called? Nursing homes. Uh, there, there was a high death toll at these nursing homes, right? Kind of similar to what we saw in the state of New York with Cuomo and, and in Michigan with, uh, with Gretchen Whitmer. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if over the course of the next months, we, we realize more and more states have, in the United States have, have, have fudged the numbers when it comes to, um, you know, uh, the, the death rate at, at retirement facilities and, and nursing homes and things like that. I wouldn't be surprised at that at all. But that was one of the things that was going on in Sweden from the from the start of all this. And at the end of it, I think they only achieved like six percent of the population being immune. You know, so so it, it didn't it didn't work. Uh, and now, you know, they the, the second their rates started dropping, they pulled back and became very relaxed and weren't doing the stringent things that they were doing in the very beginning of this. In the very beginning of this, they were, they, they were, they were pretty tight and they were pretty efficient in the way that they were trying to handle it uh, from, from what I was reading. But, you know, after April, May, it, because the numbers were kind of stabilizing, they just kind of became a little laissez faire about it, you know? So, so it didn't work, unfortunately. So why won't this work with SARS-CoV-2, right? Well, that's that's sort of the uh, the discussion that a, a lot of people have. One of the things is transmiss transmissibility, uh, how quickly this thing get, gets transmitted from person to person. Uh, this thing transmits pretty quickly. I mean, and the variants are, are moving even faster, right? It's, it's a lot quicker to transmit this thing around. 
So it becomes really difficult to contain it. So if the virus spreads more, it adapts more, it changes more, it evolves more. Uh, that's something we've known about coronaviruses. That's what they do. They mutate and evolve pretty darn quickly, which is why we have 12 different variants of this thing now. I, I, I don't know. The numbers keep the numbers keep changing in the different variants there are and aren't and which ones are active and which ones aren't. But I know right now the Delta variant is the one that a lot of people are concerned about, and rightfully so. Um you know, so it, it moves very quickly. And then there is the argument of the variants, right? So what do you do when the variants show up? Uh, if this thing is going to if this thing is going to move through the population and people start developing some uh, form of antibodies to it, well, it's going to evolve and change. And maybe those antibodies aren't as effective towards this thing anymore. So the variants themselves uh, create a problem where herd immunity becomes very, very difficult to achieve because the virus is changing. So your antibodies have to change, which means you have to get it again. And if you get it again, the likelihood of you surviving goes down. You know, each time you get it, maybe your immune response, especially if the variant, uh, you know, behaves more aggressively towards you than, than, it, than it doesn't. Uh, you know, so at that point, it, because of the variants, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work very well. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the variants was one of the reasons why when they came out, uh, and, and maybe this was the end of March, um, beginning of April, something like that, where they basically said, hey, no more masks. You know, don't worry, don't worry about the masks, uh, even if you're vaccinated, if you're unvaccinated, whatever, just you'll be fine. Just don't we're, we're lifting all of the mask mandates and this, that, and the third. Uh, I was very concerned about that because... You know, I didn't, I didn't think the rates, vaccination rates were going uh, up as much. And I also was concerned about the variants, right? Like some of the vaccines weren't fully effective towards the variants. And now I think they're saying that Pfizer is about 84% effective. Uh, it's, its efficacy has gone down because of the variants, because we need a booster, because people that got the vaccine, maybe the, the, their antibodies aren't lasting as long as they anticipated, th things like that. So again, we're learning more about this thing as time goes on, which is, which unfortunately is, is the way that this works. We, we, we didn't have information. We tried something that we thought would work. It worked a little bit. Then we got more information and go, oh, okay, we got to change our tactic. That's sort of the way science works. Uh, and that's kind of what we're finding out, right? That's kind of what we're finding out. So, the temporary immunity is also a problem for herd immunity, right? The, if the idea is to build these antibodies um, and, uh, and, and be resistant to the virus or, or any of the contagions, the fact that we don't have permanent resistance to it, that, that the antibodies last for, I think they were saying three months. I'm, I'm actually not even sure what, what the updated information about the antibodies are. This article doesn't, doesn't talk about it, but, they, but it does talk about like temporary antibodies. Like I know and that's part of the reason why we're talking about booster shots now uh, for, for all of these vaccines that are out there. Um, but there are vaccines that are more effective towards the variants now, specifically from Cuba. Um, I believe China's vaccines are also uh, pretty effective towards the variants as well. But the United States has a blockade and embargo on Cuba and and they're trying, you know, last week I talked about how they uh, the United States is claiming that China's vaccines is killing more people. Right. They're using kind of the um, the same rhetoric as vaccine deniers that these same publications like Routers and uh, New York Times have gone after. They've gone after the vaccine deniers, and then now they're using the same rhetoric when it applies to China. So again, the ideology uh, is is kind of more important than public health. If China has a vaccine that is very effective towards the variants, if Cuba has a vaccine that's very effective towards the variants, why not lift the sanctions, right? If, especially, I mean, we know that sanctions and economic wars are detrimental to societies who have been sanctioned. You know, that's and and even then a lot of these societies do pretty well with the sanctions in place. Right. So if if we are going to talk about public health and we're going to we're going to keep pushing this rhetoric of 
uh, you know, get get vaccinated, get vaccinated. It's it's the right thing to do and so on and so forth. If that's the rhetoric we're going to talk about, well, why aren't these other effective vaccines not being distributed? Because clearly America has a problem with with global distribution. Hell, we can't even we couldn't even distribute it properly in the beginning of all this. It was a total shit show. The, the, it was a logistical nightmare. Well, now you have many more countries that have developed their own vaccines that are very effective, that international scientists are saying are like, yes, th this should be distributed to various parts of the world. And Cuba wants to help and China wants to help and Russia wants to help. And all these countries want to help. And then you have nations like Africa who have less than 1% of the people vaccinated. And this virus is running rampant on top of all of the political problems that they have in that, in, on, the, in, uh, on the continent. Why not try to get, you know, get more help? Right. Once again, it goes back to rugged individualism. America can take care of everything on its own. That's what America does, baby. That's what we do. Right. Instead of saying, hey, yeah, actually, we could use some help. We're we're having a hard time spreading, you know, d d distributing the vaccine all across the world. We're having a logistical problem. Maybe if we had two or three other countries that we can work together with, we can hit different parts of the of the world. Maybe we lift the patents on these vaccines so other nations can start developing them as well. And then they can help distribute this thing. And, and you know, that will help the situation. Uh, so that that's kind of a problem. Because America has to continue pushing its its war economy forward, and they choose to do that over public health, right? The, this can continue to be afraid of so socialism and communism is far more important than helping people. So with this virus, it, it does become really, really difficult to achieve herd immunity because of because of the temporary immunity, because of the variants, because of how quickly it spreads. Um, you know, so it becomes really hard to achieve herd immunity. So it, it did become that, you know, the only way we could get ahead of this thing was through quarantining and social distancing and waiting for a vaccine to be developed. In the in the little preamble, you saw that, you know, Fauci was coming out and saying that he was willing to skip steps. And I, I you know, there were a couple I'm, I don't know whether they did or not, but it seemed like they might have because it, it, it did seem fast tracked. That was one thing I was kind of critical of is how quickly the vaccine came out and it was rolled out and all that sort of stuff. I was kind of critical of that as well. But as time went on, you know, I'm I'm I took the I, I, I got vaccinated and everything. Um, I just didn't feel particularly safe. I had to, you know, I, I had to get a, a job. I had to get a part-time job, which meant that I was going to have to work with people outside my little quarantine pod. Um, and it and it just made me feel a little safer. And it made me feel a little bit better that, you know, and, and I understood what they were saying. It, it, it said it on the freaking thing that they give you, that the, the vaccine were, you know, we're not 100% sure that the vaccine stops the spread of the virus, but it will prevent... Uh, symptoms from exacerbating so it doesn't overload the health system or the healthcare system, right? Like people aren't going to end up in the hospital. They're not going to end up on ventilators. It's not going to uh, create long lasting problems because that's what people with COVID that, you know, even people that recover from COVID uh, were facing. I know a lot of friends that got it and they were physically fit you know, like they were like doing theater and, and they were building sets and all this stuff. And then, and then after they got COVID and they were in recovery, like walking up two flights of steps was a challenge. So it, it, it does detrimental damage to your body. And knowing that, OK, if I take this thing, like at least that won't happen. And considering we're in this capitalist hellscape where we don't have a UBI and we don't have universal health care, the government's not taking care of us. And so many people fell through the cracks of getting even the, 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 the minuscule amount of stimulus that they, that they wanted to give you. Yeah, I got to get a job and I want to try to be safe about it. And and then, you know, when touring was coming back, I would not feel comfortable touring without being vaccinated. And that's a personal choice for me. If you feel differently, that's fine. I'm not here to tell you whether you should or shouldn't get a vaccine. Again, the point of this is talking about herd immunity. This first part is talking about herd immunity, right? It's not about me telling you to get a vaccine or not. To, to me, it seems like the vaccine was the, the only route that we could take considering the circumstances of 
SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I'm going to look at a few comments before we switch over uh, to the next topic. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Let me see here. Good to see you, Holly. Thank you again for, for sending the articles over. Uh, yeah, she says it was in layman's language, too. That's that's the other thing is I, I found that uh, I think the reason why I like the article so much is other articles where they talk to scientists use a lot of sciencey term. Um, and, uh, you know, she kind of does it in plain language that you can understand. Uh, da, 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 da. uh, a dingo ate me baby says, uh, it's more of a problem that you still go to that Trotsky ite web webpage after that time, Jimmy kicked that guy, that guy's, uh, but because he wanted to work with lefties and not unite the working class. Oh, I can turn off the auto scroll. Um, I, I've had my issues with World Socialist website. I, you know, it's it's like a lot of publications. There's some things that I agree with, some things that I don't. I I had a I had to kind of pull back from them because they were doing a lot more on uh, a topic that I that I didn't follow. Uh, you know, like I, I I wasn't particularly following what was going on in Myanmar and Sri Lanka and what was going on with the uh, Volvo strike. So I had a hard time following some of their articles. So I had to pull back from them. I don't agree with everything that they say, uh, you know, but they do cover a lot of stuff that other folks won't cover. Um, so I understand your criticism. I, I have my uh, problem, too. Um, <laughs> uh, a dingo ate me baby says remote remember the good old days of flattening the curve it's uh now it's take experimental gene therapy again i'm not pushing you to take the vaccine or not it's your choice whether you want to take it or not uh, i don't think it's experimental gene therapy because it's an mrna vaccine not a dna vaccine um so the mrna does not contain genetic information so uh, again if if you don't want to take the vaccine you don't have to uh, I believe China's vaccines are not mRNA vaccines. I believe Johnson & Johnson is not an mRNA vaccine. Uh, they are uh, traditional, uh, you know, they, they put the dead or inactive, is I believe is the right term, inactive viral particles into your system. So, uh, again, this is not about uh, whether I am trying to get you to take the vaccine or not. I'm, I'm not trying to get you to take the vaccine. Uh, I am just trying to have a discussion about herd immunity. And to, to me, that's also, you know, leading into why there was a push to get people vaccinated or why the vaccine was ended up being the kind of the only solution. Now, there is also uh, research that has come out uh, with uh, ivermectin. Like, I, I know I know that was helping India quite a bit uh, in the early days. Um, and if you can get your hands on that, that seems to be pretty effective. Uh, CBD. And THC is also pretty effective. They're, they're antiviral particles, so they prevent uh, the, the protein spikes from locking into your cells. So, you know, it, it doesn't turn your cells into a virus making factory. Um, so if you don't want to take the vaccine and you feel comfortable with this other stuff, then, yeah, uh, I, I would recommend you look into that, too. I'm, I'm a high proponent of the CBD method, particularly. I, I think CBD is kind of great. I think it has a lot of uh, valuable uh, medical uses same thing with thc right i think cannabis is like a, a an uh, invaluable medical resource that has been demonized in, all throughout the world not just in america right the uk has a similar problem of demonizing uh, cannabis as well so again there are options for people that don't want to take the vaccine it just it's it, it's it becomes a choice my choice is to take it because that's how I, I i feel a lot more comfortable i still take cbd when i when i need to i have a medical marijuana card so so i i do have cbd in my system so that also makes me feel better but you know i'm also wearing a mask when i go to the grocery store or the gas station and so on and so forth it's at this point you know the argument becomes one of comfort um and Holly says Sputnik five is effective. I believe it's about the same effective uh, effectiveness as Cuba's vaccines. It's a, it's at about 93, 94%. Uh, and yeah, Cuba can't get syringes with because of the sanctions. So uh, again, that's these sanctions are getting in the way, especially when the rhetoric is 
we got to do we you know what is joe biden what did joe biden say the whole time we can get through this together we can get through this together well we would be able to get through this together if you would allow effective vaccines to be distributed across the world including the united states by lifting the sanctions there's absolutely no reason for sanctions to be put into place on any country at all during a fucking pandemic period there's no argument that anybody can make there's no argument anybody can make about that there's a global pandemic people are dying because of this vaccine and there are countries that america has put sanctions on like iran like venezuela like cuba that can't get the equipment that they need iran couldn't get basic medical supplies because of the sanctions and and joe biden wants to talk about we're all going to work together on but you're not there, there's an entire nation that's dying because of your fucking sanctions the, the, the same Trump era sanctions uh, that you are upholding. So, you know, uh, the, there, there's really no argument you can. You can make with that. All right, uh, we are going to move right along. To the second part, which is. The other part that I really enjoyed that she talked about was how it became more about which ideology that you ascribe to, right? And that was more along the lines of political parties than it was like political philosophy, I guess. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm basically she points out how ideology kind of gets in the way. So let me let me find the section of the interview that I want to read. Da, 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 da. Where is it? Okay. So she basically got asked the question about that, right? Um, because she's been hypercritical of um, hypercritical of of governments that have basically put put their own political ideology in front of public health. Uh, so so this is this is what she had to say. So I think there are several factors at play. There are values at play, there are ideologies at play, and there are vested interests that are clearly influencing our governments who don't have a public interest at heart. When we talk about the values, I, I think rather than the values of protecting public health and compassion, many governments have had values of short-term economic gains and have unfortunately not realized that there is no dichotomy between public health and the economy and the countries that have managed to protect the economies the most are the ones that have gotten uh, on top of the virus and managed to contain it. I think second, uh, second thing is ideology. I think there's a lot of libertarian ideology that has influenced governments, particularly in the West, and exceptionalism, where there has been a certain arrogance in not learning lessons from many parts of the world uh, we could have learned lessons from and that were affected uh, earlier than uh, than us in the pandemic and responded much better. So again, she kind of points out the short-term economic interests, right? There's a lot of short-term economic interests uh, that basically took, took over public health, right? So that's stuff like... Uh, Stuff like bailing out the banks, the, tr the trillion dollars, the, the trillions of dollars that they spent bailing out the banks. And that same amount of money could have been used for recurring payments to help every single American family. Uh, no problem. You invented about six trillion dollars to bail out a bank. That same amount could have gone to helping out Americans for a year. Uh, instead, Steve Mnuchin came out and said that uh, twelve hundred dollars should last the American people about 10 months. Uh, which is in, uh, yeah, okay, maybe in 1841. That, yeah, 1200 bucks would have lasted Americans 10 months. But if this was 1841, you would give everybody about a dollar fifty and call it a day. So, you know, but so the choice again was made, um, in terms of public, and then it became like, well, you want to get everybody back to work, right? You want to get that's something that I heard from, from folks on the right. Uh, that didn't like the masks, that didn't like the mandates, that didn't like the the quarantining and all that sort of stuff. I, I heard that a lot is, oh, well, you know, people got to work. We got to get people back to work. How long can people not work? I mean, that's kind of the reason, that's one of the reasons why it spread across the country the way that it did, is people were getting sick, couldn't take off work, because if they took off work, they might either lose a significant pay, you know, or, or important pay, 
uh, or get fired. So they came into work sick and spread it around. And those people took it to their families. Their families took it to the grocery store, to schools, so on and so forth. You know, it's just part of that is how it spread. And again, we can look back to Cuba, right? Short-term economic interests and ideologies. Cuba right now, if they lift the sanctions, if they lift the blockade, uh, you know, you have countries like Mexico and uh, I think Venezuela. I might be wrong. Don't quote me on the Venezuela part. But I know Mexico is, is going to send aid to Cuba to help them distribute the vaccine. Mexico was going to send 9 billion doses of, uh, of the vaccine over to India when India was having its problem two months ago. Where was America in that? Right? There is, the, she talks about exceptionalism. That's something that America preaches all the time. Right? American exceptionalism. We're the best of the best. We're the greatest country in the whole fucking world. Okay. Well, you didn't do a great job distributing this vaccine very well. In fact, a, a country that desperately needs it, a country that is a key ally for you, India, was suffering. And they they hoarded a million doses of AstraZeneca, which is not approved in the United States. It is approved in the UK. It is approved in, in parts of Europe and in India. They hoarded a, a million doses of that, a million doses that could have gone to India and helped get a, 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 a lot of people vaccinated enough that it would push the percentage a lot higher why, why didn't they again short-term economic interest right because if if things go tits up let's say pfizer or moderna or j and j they end up getting a lawsuit because somebody you know had a stroke or a blood clot or a unexpected side effect or so on and so forth let's say there was a lawsuit it becomes a little too difficult, a little too economically unviable to keep one of these. Well, they can just get AstraZeneca approved by the FDA. And now we have a million doses of that. So they did this contingency plan. Which, again, that sort of stuff is plays right into the, you know, the vaccine denier narratives as well. The, the stuff that you hear from people that don't want to take the vaccine is that it's dangerous, right? And And I'm not saying that there aren't side effects or anything i went through a list of stuff when i uh, a week after i got the vaccine i got crazy stomach pain like i was delusionally in pain and i couldn't figure out why uh and i went through like did i eat something strange i didn't eat anything strange i haven't i've barely eaten anything at all this seems really weird i've had gas pain before this doesn't feel like that you know and i boil it down to hey it's probably this side effect of the vaccine and i called my doctor and she was like yep that's probably what it was. J&J &J has a lot of uh, digestive side effects that they have. You probably just got a crazy uh, intense one. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not saying that there are no side effects to this thing. There are. And when those side effects occur, it should be the corporation's responsibility to accept that responsibility and say, hey, we, yeah, we didn't see that side effect coming. We fucked up we're going to try to fix it. We're going to, you know, and, and J, I think J and J did because the, the blood clots became like a very big public thing. And, and there was a lot of public outcry, which again is how corporations work, right? If there's a lot of public outcry against something, then they have to take action against it because then it's hurting their bottom line, going back to that short term economic goals that they have in mind. Going back to Cuba, you know, everybody, the big claim is communism doesn't work. It kills people. Communism kills people. Well, then why do you have a sanction against it? If, if it's really going to fail, why not let it fail and prove yourself right? Why put economic blockades to say, see, like you're manufacturing the failure. Your fear of communism is getting in the way of public health. If they have two vaccines right now that they can distribute on a global level, if they got the op opportunity to do it, if they got the equipment to do it, and you're you're theory is that communism will fail okay let them distribute it the way that they would like to and see if they fail but the but the fear is that they won't fail so you manufacture the failure putting that ideology first same thing with the ubi right there there's there's no enacting of a ubi and nancy pelosi was very adamantly against it uh more i mean it, it, more democrats were against it 
I expect the Republicans to be against it, but the Democrats were, there was a, so many of them against uh, the idea of a UBI. Same thing with, with enacting universal health care, which Joe Biden can do right now, today, if he wanted to, uh, using the Social Security Act, he could give everybody health care, but they can't because it's because they're scared of socialism. So the argument then becomes about freedom, right? Oh, people are taking your freedom away, so on and so forth. And then it becomes using the tools of propaganda to start disavowing various different scientific outlets and aligning them with certain p political parties. You know, F Fauci kind of became a, ch a champion of the Democrats, and I'm no, I'm no fan of Fauci. I'm not a fan of the CDC or the FDA either. Uh, but again, I'm going off of what this doctor says and that was the problem they they made science a political argument when science should not be associated with politics at all um there was a doctor i believe david nutt i believe was his name in the uk he was uh in he was in, in a government office and he got fired for coming out and saying that hey psychedelics and cannabis should be you know, used for mental health purposes. They have a lot of medical benefits. And he got fired for saying that. And he basically said, you know, science and politics should not be together. You know, politics should not be influencing what science says. That should be done by research and information. It, it, it's nice, but politics is politics and science is science. They're two separate things. And, you know, in this in this circumstance, we should be listening to scientists that uh, to me, scientists should not be involved in any sort of government office. The <clears throat> um, you know, because because government offices and political parties have agendas and they have donors and they have, uh, you know, private interests and, and all that sort of stuff. Gets in the way of science. We can also look at some hypocrisy that happened, right? Where ideology came before the uh, before public health, before public uh, health interests were were taken into account. Look at the way the American Federation of Teachers, the AFT, uh, dealt with reopening schools in August of 2020, when Trump wanted to reopen schools and send kids for in-person learning instead of online learning, which over the course of the summer was was you know not particularly happening they weren't really training like there there were i talked to some teachers uh in in the fall and there were some some teachers said that they got some kind of training for teaching kids online but a lot of them didn't and then at the very end you know it was a cost saving measure so they switched to a different thing it, it, but there wasn't anything consistent you could have you could have just trained your teachers to teach virtually that that could have happened but they didn't and when trump wanted to open up the schools the aft came out with the you know a, a, a standard operating procedure of what they would need to do in order to reopen schools safely now in january of this year in january 2021 biden wanted to reopen schools why because he needed people to get back to work and I, you know, I have friends that are parents and I talk to them about that. And they said, yeah, if they went to school, it'd be a lot easier, even from even when I'm working from home, because I can't do my job and pay attention to my kid at the same time. It's just too difficult. Being 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 a parent where where you live and work in the same place is is difficult, especially when your kids are home all the time. And I wholeheartedly understand that. Right. I completely understand that. But when Biden wanted to reopen the schools, Randy Weingarten, the president of the AFT, who sits on the board of the DNC, which is exactly why this decision was made, was pushing for schools to get reopened. And even Fauci made a statement where he said, yeah, I think we should reopen the schools. And when people were saying, hey, the science says that community spread starts with schools. He said, yeah, I know, but we got to get these kids into the classroom. 
because the ideology took over. They had to stand with the Democratic Party. And what was the party saying? The party was saying we have to open schools. But the numbers weren't any different. Cases were still going up in January. Cases were still going up in August of 2020. Nothing was different except the political party in charge. So ideology got in the way of science. Ideology got in the way of what scientists were saying. They were saying, hey, this is this is not safe. This is not the right thing to do. That level of hypocrisy causes confusion. It causes people to, to you know, and, and they should be questioning this stuff. I'm, I'm not di and discouraging people to question things, but it causes that questioning. If they were forthwith, if they were honest and said, look, we want fucking people to get back to work. So corporations can start making money. So my donors can feel better about themselves. That's what it was. There's a major disconnect here. I mean, on a dime, the, the Democratic Party switched its position on everything. And it was no different than the positions that Trump was proposing. This is when Trump was proposing they were against it. So ideology, ideology has taken over. In, in a lot of these circumstances, and people start ignoring science. People start ignoring what independent scientists are saying, what researchers are saying about certain things, because it doesn't fit what the ideology wants them to fit. Both sides talk about science, but when it comes to the economy, they're willing to ignore it. Think of how much safer we would have been. Think of how 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 much more reduced the spread would have been in the very beginning of things if instead of bailing out the banks, they would have bailed out the people. If everybody, if, if everybody in America was getting, even if it was a thousand bucks a month, it would have made a massive difference to people. Even a thousand bucks a month, right? Like it would have made a really, really big difference. If they would have done that, you know, let's say people that are working from home don't particularly need that thousand bucks a month. But let's say there's a bunch of people that are out of work, restaurant workers, entertainers like myself, you know, uh, bartenders, folks like that, sound engineers, right? Now these kids, the, these people are working from home. They're still getting a steady paycheck, but they got their kid that's going to school. And they need someone to help their kid during school hours to get through the day so that the parents can come in, get a little update, and then help their kids with the homework that they have. Boom, you just created a job. Thousand, an extra thousand bucks a month could go directly into the pockets of other Americans that could use that thousand bucks a month. From Americans that don't need that thousand bucks a month. So now we're all kind of helping each other. and that, But that's that comes from a government that, you know, just gives an iota of a shit <laughs> about its populace. And, you know, I, I think capitalism often works in opportunities. They, it looks for opportunities that it can take advantage of. And I think this was one of the circumstances what that, where that happened, where for the Democrats, it was let's use the vaccine and let's use the virus as a way to get votes. And then when they got their votes and they got into office, they were pushing the same shit that Trump was pushing, which creates even more confusion. But that's the goal. The goal is to create confusion and that makes it hard to navigate through the haze and figure out what information is is accurate and what isn't accurate. You know, like I said, I, I knew that when I was going to talk about this, there are going to be people in the comment section that are going to disagree with me. And there are going to be people that are going to viscerally fucking hate me for what I'm saying. And, and, and that's the consequence of this. All right, let me check a few of the comments. Cynical girl, welcome. Good to see you. Ha, cynical girl says, Biden was just spewing his vile American exceptionalism on C-SPAN while pushing the vaccine and being horseshit about how we're controlling the pandemic and then talking about evictions in the same breath. <laughs> Yeah, he just it, it's it's why like that that dude is there's so much hypocrisy that comes out of these people in one fail swoop. It's 
if you're if you're not somebody that's constantly paid attention to this over the years, it's very easy to get confused by all this. I can I can understand that because that's how I was in the beginning of all this when I started paying attention to politics very you know a, a lot more. When I started seeing the hypocrisy of some of the statements, where one one thing was being said one uh, one week and then you know a, another thing was being said a, a different week, and it was like, wait, what what the fuck is happening? It, you know, and then you find out that it's all moneyed interest and so on and so it, it's it that it creates that confusion, and that's what they, they thrive on. That they thrive on creating confusion. They thrive on the fact that you know most Americans don't have. Uh, Kevin Gastola said this on my podcast recently it's the united states of amnesia you know people don't remember anything except for the current president and the president before them that's it and if they don't like the current president they think that the previous president was awesome and if they didn't like the previous president they think the current president's awesome it's just a cycle of the of, of shit yeah it, 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 yeah a thousand dollars would be a huge difference for a lot of people holly points out richard nixon wanted a guaranteed income he sure did uh, Nixon would be very liberal compared to the Republicans today. And the reason why the Republicans are the way that they are today is because of people like Joe Biden and Bill Clinton, who needed to be big, tough guys. We're big, tough guys. We're Democrats, but we're big, tough guys. So in order to stroke their own ego, which is what they call their penis, uh, they decided to put out the crime bill, the mass incarceration, build the prison industrial complex, and the Republicans had to move even further to the right because, well, if the Democrats are acting like Republicans and they want to give people, you know, economic aid, then what's the point of voting for a Republican? So the Republicans had to push even further to it. So Biden is one of the reasons why we have um, the Republican Party the way that it is. Uh C CG says, uh, had they supplied UBI and people had stayed the fuck home, we, would, we wouldn't be in this mess. We wouldn't be in as much of a mess for sure. Uh, I, think, I, I think people would have still gone out and done some of the stuff that they did, but it wouldn't have been as bad. Uh, oh, here's something else. Biden is pushing the states to distribute the monies for rental assistance, but not everybody qualifies. They drag through the red tape. The system is bogged down to the point of absolute dysfunction. Again, they gave $6 trillion to the bank. They could have very much invested a portion of that money to update a lot of these systems. They could have used that money to update the social security system. They could have used that money to update the rental assistance systems. Uh, and, you know, part of the other thing that a lot of people were facing with the rental assistance too, and, and this, this kind of tires into the, into the pandemic and stuff is they, it's arbitrary dates and it's a very difficult website to, to work. So a lot of people, again, fall through the cracks. They fall through the cracks. Um, people are saying he's extended the moratorium, but that's not what I heard on C-SPAN right now. I haven't seen that either. And I feel like if he did expand the moratorium, um, they would have, uh, it would have, it would have been a lot bigger. Um, yeah. So, all right. So th this is kind of the last part of, uh, what I wanted to talk about, which, and this is something that I was, I was kind of interested in reading with her is vaccine mandates. So I want to pull that part. Up. Oh, I think I missed a portion of it. I did miss. I did miss one thing I wanted to talk about, which was she talks about kids, right? Uh, there, there is a lot of information and kind of confusion about kids and what happens with kids. Uh, let me see if I can find that quote. If I can't find that quote, I'll try to summarize what she said. Here we are. I found it. Uh, boom. Okay. Again, she says, it has become very evident over the past year that children play a massive role in the spread of infection. I mean, there's been a lot of misinformation and disinformation around this and minimizing the role of children in the infection. We've heard that children are less susceptible to, uh, to infection or they're less likely to transmit or uh, even they are not an important part of community transmission. This is absolutely not true. I think regardless of susceptibility, susceptibility and transmissibility, 
we need to remember that children come in contact with many more people than adult to, adults do, uh, given they attend school in person. There are recent studies, including ones from the CDC, that show that when you correct for the fact that most infections uh, infections in children or many inf infections in children are asymptomatic. They're not detected because children may not come forward for testing because they don't feel unwell. Uh, when you correct for that in these studies, you find that children are equally susceptible to adults and equally likely to transmit. But the fact that they have many more contacts makes them a critical route of transmission back into the community. And these studies also demonstrated that the parents of children are at high risk of infection and requiring hospitalization. So again, she's pointing out community spread starts with schools because the kids might be asymptomatic and we can't, you know, you can't vaccinate kids. It doesn't seem like it's, uh, the vaccine is, is right for kids under 16. And, you know, it's boom. I don't think we should have schools in person. I think it should be virtual. I think we should have spent this entire time trying to figure out, you know, that's a, that's a completely missing, we talk about free enterprise and innovation under capitalism. There could have been a tech company that could have been working on creating a really interesting and dynamic education system and education platform that schools could have used, colleges could have used, PhD programs could have used to help help teachers and students learn virtually. And at this point, too, it becomes a matter of um, choice, right? Like a school can choose to be in person. A, a school can choose to be hybrid. A school can choose to be in person or, or virtual. The issue with the schools is y y you got to pick a thing, man. Going from virtual to hybrid to on to in person back to virtual back to hybrid back that's way more fucking detrimental for kids. The inconsistency of things way more fucking de detrimental for kids than you know being virtual all full time or being in person full time. Regardless of where you fall on that, I think the transitionary element of it is is far more detrimental psychologically than than not. Uh, and, and they're saying, you know, that the, the, there's a good possibility that the variants start with the kids because they spread, you know, that they're kind of the starting point of all this stuff. So, uh, but yeah, I do want to get to the, let me get to the vaccine mandates part. Okay. So this is the part that I, 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 I particularly I, you know, I, I kind of vibed with this a little bit. Uh, she says, perhaps I have a different view on vaccine mandates. I understand the need for vaccine mandates in healthcare settings and care home settings. Uh, I'm a medic myself. And before I went to the hospital, I had to get my Hep B vaccine. And that's a requirement. And I understand why, because the decisions we make influence the risks that our patients are subjected to, many of whom are vulnerable. And if they were to get infected, they could get very ill. So I think I understand mandates in in that setting. Population level mandates, I'm less comfortable with, and I'll explain uh, I'll explain the reasons for that. Uh, I think vaccine hesitancy is a very very heterogeneous thing, and it's not uh, all anti-vax conspiracy theory. There are people who are hesitant about taking vaccines because of very legitimate reasons. They don't trust the governments because our governments have let them down. They don't trust healthcare services because they've let them down. And I'm here talking about ethics. Uh, I'm here talking about uh, ethnic minorities specifically because these, uh, because these is a, uh, I think that's a misprint. Uh, they, these are historical contexts here. Uh, these are groups that have previously been subject to unethical experiments uh, by our scientific community who have been let down repeatedly by government, immigration, and even discriminated against by healthcare. We know, for example, that uh, for, for example, that I think minorities have worse experiences in healthcare, and often their symptoms are not believed, and they have worse outcomes. Which is true. That's actually one of the things that uh, I, I know in the black community, a, a lot of people faced is when they talked about being in pain. Um, you know, this is pseudoscience. This is racist pseudoscience, where they said, "Oh, black people have a higher threshold for pain." That's just something that they believed all black people had. Again. 
this is part of American science that was debunked. And, you know, we had to abandon and move forward and say, hey, maybe that maybe we should fucking listen when people say that they're in a lot of pain and not think that, oh, because of the color of their skin or what ethnicity they belong to, that they're faking it or or it isn't as severe as they claim it is. Um, and it doesn't even make sense. If, if the racist notion is that black people are you know, have a higher tolerance to pain and they're complaining about pain, doesn't that mean that the pain that they're in is probably far more extreme than any, than, than like a white person would face? Like, shouldn't you fucking listen to that regardless? This is why racism is fucking stupid. Sorry, it's... Uh, uh, all right. Ba -ba -ba -ba, I lost my place. Uh, okay, and I think addressing that uh, even with the mandate, uh, even with... The mandate is not appropriate and rather and rather unfair because it risks further marginalizing groups that already don't trust the systems for very good reason. So I know I took a little bit of a, a sidetrack there to talk about the race science crap. But, uh, you know, that this is something that I've seen when so whenever I saw those those vaccine mandates and stuff, I, I looked at it as, you know, people are going to lean even harder into the the beliefs that they believe in right the the people that think that the vaccines are super kudos a, a good majority of them are likely going to be for vaccine mandates showing your vaccination card uh proving you have a negative test so on and so forth right they're going to lean harder into saying yeah that's what needs to be done and then the opposite side is the 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 folks that don't like the vaccine that are against the vaccine are going to lean even harder to say, oh, look, now the vaccine is being used to strip away our rights, to strip away our privacy, right? Um, because it's a HIPAA violation. This is a this is a medical thing, right? So you can't ask somebody about about their medical history and stuff. I mean, that was the thing. I went to a Target, and I, and I was so I was pretty upset because you know there were people not wearing masks in the store. Nobody seemed to be enforcing it. Every, all of the employees were great but like it was the consumers and i talked to the customer service and they're like yeah we can't really do anything about that we can recommend it we can tell them that they can wear a face shield if they have other medical conditions but we can't ask them about medical conditions right so the corporations were saying like they can't ask people about their medical conditions or their vaccinations but now it's starting to become like oh yeah we should be doing that for these venues and again i understand both sides of the argument and that's part of the reason why i was like it, I, when she said when when the, when i read this paragraph i was like yeah this is how we should kind of be approaching this thing realize that there there is many reasons a lot of them are legitimate because you don't trust the government because you don't trust health systems because you don't trust corporations that are producing this vaccine all of those are very legitimate reasons to be a little wary of this vaccination now, I talk to several people. I, I have people in my life that are in, in science that I trust, that I spoke with, that looked over what these vaccines were and broke it down to me in plain English, much like this woman is doing now. And that's how I made my decision for it. Again, if you have a different route and you, and you looked into some stuff and you talked to some people that you trust and, and you decided, hey, this isn't for me, then that's fine. Just respect the people that made the decision to make that choice for themselves. So she keeps going and saying, uh, this is the last part of it. She says, I think the way that needs to be addressed is through active community engagements and acknowledging those failures and understanding why vaccine hesitancy exists and trying to address that, uh, address that directly rather than forcing groups that already distrust the government to engage in something that they are not comfortable with without actually trying to understand why and address that directly. So the the piece that I did at the very beginning, right, it's it's a part of an old virtual stand-up bit about why people don't trust vaccines. There's various reasons. There's psychological reasons and there's corporate reasons, you know, and, and that's what she's saying here. That's why I like this answer. Because it just doesn't condemn these people and marginalize them. I had no interest in doing that. So the people that do disagree with me and want to scream at me in the comment section, I don't, I don't hate you. And I also am not trying to force you into taking the vaccine. But yet, 
just by talking about it and and me myself being someone that took the vaccine and in saying hey look there are here are my reasons for why i don't think herd immunity works and why i think we should be looking at a vaccine and i do agree that we need corporate transparency and i do agree that we need political transparency in this country you know we there there's probably a lot more that we agree on than we don't That's what we need in this country. We need corporate and political transparency. Same thing. If I know there are folks that have taken the vaccine and they passed away within a day or two after taking the vaccine. Completely healthy people. There's records of that all, all over the internet. Instead of hiding that story, which only perpetuates these people to think that, uh, you know, that there is something shady going on behind the scenes you should come out and say and these corporations should have said hey this is really unfortunate what can we do to help these people and now we're going to take a step back and figure out what happened so we don't have to see the see any more people die because of these vaccines let's do the let's do the testing now how can the corporations help the people whose you know lives have been taken because they took this vaccine and it didn't it didn't suit their body and there are cases of that, not astronomical. You know, the percentages are pretty low. But we need corporate transparency on it. Even if the percentages are low, the folks that don't like the vaccine are going to use that to validate their belief system. We all do that. We all do that. That's something that we, when we see something that validates what we believe in, we stick to it and lean harder into it. That's something that we all do. And we have to recognize that when it happens. And try to look at things objectively and try to look at things from other people's perspective, too. So the people that are against the vaccine, maybe you've lost somebody, maybe you didn't, right? Uh, uh, my my guess would be possibly that you didn't. You, you haven't lost somebody to COVID. You haven't seen someone suffer through it. A lot of other people have. Uh, I, I, I lost a great uncle and great aunt in India, um, you know, and and I felt terrible for members of my family because they couldn't give them the last rites had to do an abridged version if that and it sucks it was terrible it was awful i know a lot of other people that have lost family members friends so on and so forth or people that have that, that i know that have seen people recover from this thing and not be the same so if you're somebody that doesn't believe that this thing is real don't go to those people that have lost people to covid and be shitty to them. And, and those people aren't going to be shitty to you. If you just come out and say, hey, man, I'm, I'm really, really sorry for your loss. That's all it has to be. You don't need to dive into this is why you don't have to take. Because if you lose somebody, I'm not going to go in and try to put my ideology in front of your grief. But I've seen people take the opportunity to do that. Now, again, going back to the corporations, I think if somebody does pass away from from after they took the vaccine, perfectly healthy people, there should be corporate transparency for this. They should take responsibility for what happened. Now, the thing that she says in this, uh, we'll, we'll scroll down just a little bit because I'm, I'm keeping this up on stage, up on stage, what? Uh, up on the page. Um uh, but, you know, she says that in order to get out of the pandemic, we need uh, a system that protects public health, uh, educates our society, and e economically is a global coordinated elimination strategy of, of how to get rid of it. Uh, you know, I, I think she's right. We probably do need a coordinated effort. We, we need to start dropping sanctions and blockades. We need to start sharing our technology and our research. We need to get rid of these patents. We need to provide global economic relief to the people instead of corporations. Uh, and it, it also would mean a rejection of capitalism and coming together under the banner of saving our species, it, it, you know, saving hundreds of millions of lives. Are we going to do it? Probably not. You know, I, I think this pandemic could have been an opportunity for that, for, for, for a little bit of a global renaissance, but it didn't happen, which is unfortunate.
It's really, really fucking unfortunate. If not now, when? Right? We're, we're in this global pandemic. All of us are kind of dealing with this shit together, even regardless of whether you think it's r real or not. You're still dealing with it. The governments are still enacting laws and, you know, moving forward with this being in mind. So, so regardless of whether you believe in it or not, you're still a part of the fight. You're still in it. But instead, we got split up. So here's her final thought to all this. Uh, and, and I really like what she has to say here. Uh, she says, I think leaders need to drop their ideologies and work with stakeholders to come up with policies based on evidence, but follow evidence alongside people who are motivated to affect change. Leaders have often done things on behalf of the public think uh, on behalf of the public thinking that this is what the public wants when the public is actually far more cautious and far more informed than the governments tend to think, which is absolutely true, right? Is is I, I know information that I would not I would bet that Joe Biden ignores. He knows, but he ignores, doesn't want to kind of hold it in his brain, right? Like, uh, same thing with any other politician. I think people are a lot smarter than what governments give credit for. And I think that governments want to keep people thinking that they themselves are stupid because it serves their cause. Rather than, the, look, they're public servants. They're our employees. Elected officials are our employees. They work for us. They should be listening to what we want and enacting laws and legislation based on what we want and need and not what corporations want and need that's the that's the that's the the chasm between us and politicians we are far more informed and we're far more to the left than governments are that's just the reality of it and she goes on to say i would like to see governments working with groups like uh, business groups with teachers, with unions, with advocacy groups, with scientists, with parents uh, and students to co-create policy in a way that's beneficial to everyone and not prioritize one thing over the other. Uh, I believe that's kind of what Save Our Stages did when they were trying to help like venues economically to try to pass a bill that would end up giving venues uh, a huge economic leg up so that they can come back and keep putting on shows and pay artists and pay sound people and pay bartenders and so on and so forth. But they wrote the fucking bill for him. Amy Klobuchar didn't write that bill. She had it fucking handed to her on a silver platter. All she had to do was go, yep, I like venues. I'm voting for this bill to get passed. I honestly don't know. I don't have an update on that, though. Uh, I am sorry about that. I don't I don't have an update on uh, on what's going on with the Save Our Stages stuff. I, I, I should look into it, but there's been so much stuff. Uh so, and the, the last thing she says, I would like to see them work with scientific evidence and not misinformation or ideology and stop prioritizing one aspect of society over the other because all aspects depend on us getting past this crisis, which means being honest with the public and containing the crisis that's, uh, that confronts us rather than ignoring it and dismissing it, which has never worked because there's no way to spin our way out of this. We must address the problem in front of us. Again, goes back to transparency. We need more corporate and political transparency in our system. Um, I have one more uh, little section to get through. Uh, I know this one's kind of long. This is a little bit of a long stream here today, but I I, I want to kind of get through this next little little section here. Uh, but I want to look at uh, some of your comments. Uh, Sunuga so Girl says they refuse to tell us everything in Florida. They don't even report daily locally. They have uh, they keep having reports of prominent people dying, but our COVID death numbers haven't changed in months. Yeah, see, stuff like that is why that ends up, again, kind of revalidating folks that don't trust that sort of stuff. And they come out and they go, see, they're not they're lying about these numbers. How long have they been lying about those numbers? Same thing with the Cuomo stuff, right? When 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 we learned that Cuomo fudged the numbers and the DOJ goes in and goes, why? And he goes, oh, well, Trump. And they go, all right, good enough. And they fucking let him go. Those sorts of things don't help build public trust. They end up creating more uh more people that don't trust you and don't trust what they have to say. And, you know, these folks might have been 
uh, folks that might have taken the vaccine and they look at what's happening and they go, well, if they've been lying about these numbers, how many other numbers have been they've been lying about? Maybe they overinflated numbers in certain cases. Maybe they underinflated it. They start asking these questions and then veer into that territory of, well, I don't believe in, you know, I don't believe anybody that says anything about the vaccine and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry you're going through that, CG. It's, it, it seems like it sucks. Um, over on Odyssey, uh, somebody says, every single facet of COVID was covered up, hidden, and lied about by our own people. Our people did this to us when that shit happens. There is no trust, no ideology. Not ideology, it's human nature. They view us as subjects. We're not dealing with this shit together. I do agree that we're not dealing with this shit together. I think there's, a, especially in America, there's a notion of rugged individualism. So rugged individualism becomes kind of like the key uh, to moving things forward. So everybody just has to take care of themselves when that's not particularly true. Uh, th that kind of leads me into the, the last little section is, again, I do believe that this pandemic could have been a really nice way to bring us all together, right? And to, and, and to fight back against a system that has no concept of trying to fucking work for the people. And we could have pushed it in that direction. And in some ways, we did come together, right? In some ways, we did start taking care of each other. We had a huge mutual aid revolution in this country that was expanded because of the pandemic. You know, uh, a lot more people, I, I donated to some mutual aids. Um, you know, I know a lot of other people donated to mutual aids. If you haven't, look up a mutual aid in your city right now. You want to know how restaurant workers in, 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 in the city of Pittsburgh were able to get through this pandemic? Because there was a Pittsburgh restaurant workers mutual aid that worked on, uh, you know, collecting food, donations, uh, equipment, stuff like that, and delivering it to people that needed it. And they didn't expect anything out of it. They did it because they just wanted to help people. That's the whole goal of it. So when I see that sort of stuff... I'm excited. It gives me hope. It shows me that, yeah, part of the human nature, you know, part of human nature is greed, but it's a part that we don't have to give into. If we start listening to the more compassionate side, if we start listening to the more logical side, perhaps we don't have to run through this rugged individualism bullshit that only keeps us apart and that has never really worked. But then we get divided by opportunistic capitalists. Right. One one party says one thing. The other party says the exact opposite. Uh, and they go, well, if you believe in this, vote for us. If you don't believe in this, then vote for the other guy. And, and, and that's how they operate. And, and if you don't believe in the same thing that I believe in, you can go fuck yourself. And they sowed that divide. And, and that's where we are in, in, in all of our communities. We, and, and look, I, I, I'm not going to lie. There are times where I get exhausted from people. I really do. Who doesn't, though? Who fucking doesn't? But at the end of the day, I know that a lot fo a lot of folks... I had a conversation with somebody on Sunday at the show. You know, the, the guy is, is more libertarian than me, and but, but doesn't trust the government, thinks, you know, that the two-party system is fucked and that corporations aren't people. So we need to, like, get... We need to start organizing as people. I was great. Great. Awesome. So far, I, I'm in line with everything that you're saying. He talked about ethical capitalism. I said, I disagree with you that ethical capitalism exists. And we still had a very nice conversation. Nobody yelled at each other, we listened to each other's perspective. But if you talk to a Democrat or a Republican, I should not be talking to someone like that. So they try to, you know, sow some divide into it. And that's what they did with all this. Eventually, the discussion lands on freedom, right? I got, I have the freedom. I have the right to do whatever I want. Da, 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 da. You're stepping on my rights. You're stepping on my freedoms. Yada, yada, yada. Look, this is the reality. Absolute freedom doesn't fucking exist. It doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist. There is no absolute freedom. There is no absolute consequence free freedom. There just isn't, right? I, I hear this from people all the time. Oh, free speech is dead. Free speech is dead. You can't say certain words anymore. Uh, what? 
that's just about respecting a group of people or respecting just one person that doesn't particularly like certain language. If something you identified as was being used as a slur to mean stupid or, uh, you know, uh, anything else like dumb or whatever, and you identify as that word, that is a representation of you, you have taken that person's freedom away to be respected as a, as a human being. <laughs> freedom of speech isn't gone. It's just a matter of how you want to respect other people or not. Things change. Things evolve. Certain things don't become acceptable or funny anymore because it's causing more harm than not. So I'll, I'll put it this way. like let, let, Let's say there's an establishment that you love. It's a music venue, a restaurant, a bar, whatever. And uh, and they come out and they say, look, if you're vax, don't worry about wearing a mask. Uh, but if you aren't, please do wear a mask. We're, we're highly recommending that you do. Um, but regardless of whether you're vaxxed or not, if the server comes to your table uh, or you go up to the bar to, to place an order um, or if you're going to the bathroom or something, please put on a mask. We're just trying to be safe. And this is how we as an establishment can ensure that safety. Now, you know, Part of their freedom is to put these rules in place to help people have the freedom of safety and comfort in that environment, right? It's the freedom to feel safe and healthy. And that is people have the right to be free and safe and healthy. But some of the people that aren't going to get vaccinated might look at that as a freedom uh, or, or, or rather a restriction of their freedoms because they have to wear a mask at, at certain points while they're indoors. Uh, and, and, you know, in a lot of these places, it's not even saying that it's mandatory that you wear a mask if you're unvaccinated. They're just saying, please do. You know, we're being polite about it. You know, and, and, and I know that there's a lot of people that aren't going to do that. Now, if you're, if you're un, un, unvaxxed and, and you're, you're saying that this is affecting, look, you can still enter the venue. You can still go catch a concert. You can still enjoy a good meal. You can still go grab a drink at the bar. Just saying, hey, when our employees come over, if you could just pop a, you know, slip the mask on your face for like two minutes, put your order in, and then you can take the mask off and start drinking and eating. That'd be great. Graham Elwood said this, and I and I and I think I, you know, I I agree with him when he says that it is his right to feel safe. So if a venue is going to put in a vaccine, you know, like prove you're vaccinated or prove that you're, you're you've tested negative for in, within the last 48 hours, that's the right. That's the way that they fe make people feel safe and comfortable. And that's also those folks' rights. And as a performer who, you know, he points it out, he was like, I see hundreds and thousands of people when I'm, when I'm on tour. I want to make sure that people that are coming in are, are, are safe or are, aren't going to, you know, spread the virus to me and I spread the virus to everybody else. I, I, that's just a responsibility. You're still not barred from going to this venue. It just means, Hey, please be, be please be safe. Please respect our rights to feel safe and to feel healthy. And so it just boils down to respect. That's, that's really it. You can't have absolute freedom because Everybody has different experiences. We have different psychologies. We have a different outlook that all contributes to who we are and what we believe and how we arrive to the conclusions that we arrive to. It's very difficult to say that you are wrong based on your experiences. It's very difficult to say that. Uh, and, and and so, you know, if you are somebody that that is vaccinated and you know somebody that is unvaccinated and doesn't want to, get vaccinated, you know, perhaps a conversation is needed where you say, well, tell me what's up, what's going on. Is there something you don't trust? Is it a medical reason? So on and so forth. And if you're unvaccinated and you find, uh, you, you know, you have people that are vaccinated or you have a venue that's saying, Hey, we, we need, we, we're putting X, Y, Z. At that point, it becomes a choice. Do you want to continue supporting that venue or not? Or perhaps there's a different venue that you can go to that doesn't have these sort of restrictions and they bring in, you know, similar acts and so on and so forth. It's just a matter of being respectful to each other. 
you know, if if a venue that I, I'm I I would be in the same position if a venue said, hey, we're gonna look at people's vaccination cards and we're gonna see if they have a negative COVID test within the last forty eight hours. Okay, that's your choice as a venue, uh, and you know, I I'm I'm gonna say okay. If that's what it takes for people at that space to feel comfortable being in that space, then that's what it's going to take. And you can choose to say, hey, I don't want to come see you because of these rules. And I would say, you know, that's unfortunate. I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, these are the rules of the venue. Most people don't seem to have a problem with it. And and I and I like the place. And I like the people that come here. And and I want to I want to perform. And I, I also want to feel safe. I hope you understand that. So... Yeah. I hope this, you know, cl clarified a few things. Let me look at the last round of, of, of comments here. Uh, and we will wrap things up. <laughs> uh, Cynical Girl says, I don't, I don't uh, care about having to wear a mask. I was veiled before all this. I'm a mask for life now. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I still I still put a mask on when I go into grocery stores and gas stations and all that sort of stuff. So, um, again, what makes you feel comfortable? Okay, we are going to wind things down, wrap things up. If you guys enjoyed this live stream, please make sure that you hit the like button, hit the share button, and please make sure you are subscribed to my page. Uh, if Especially if you're watching this later on YouTube or on Facebook, uh, please make sure that you're subscribed because they unsubscribe people quite often. Uh, and uh, if you are in a stable financial place and, and would like to make a donation and can make a donation, you can go do so right over at my website, krishmohanhaha.com slash donate, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com slash donate. Sustaining members get free tickets to live and virtual shows. Uh, they get uh, bonus stand-up comedy content that nobody else gets, and you get to ask me questions directly that I can either answer on the live stream or on the virtual shows. So, and, and there's other fun bonus stuff that you get as well. Uh, if you miss one of these videos, if you miss one of these live streams, uh, the best place to catch them is right on my email list at krishmohanhaha.substack.com. Uh, I send it out every Sunday. And sometimes they include an essay that the email list gets to see first before I release it on my website. So again, that's krishmohanhaha.substack.com. Again, I've got live shows coming up. Uh, Pittsburgh, Williamsport, Louisville, Lansing, Detroit, Cleveland. I'm coming back to Cleveland to open for Ron Placone and Graham Elwood. Uh, I'm going to be in Baltimore confirming D.C. Uh, and I'm working on a bunch of other dates uh, and as long as things don't go ballistic, we'll we'll have uh, we'll have a good time at these shows. I'm very excited about them, so I'm hoping that the numbers stay pretty okay in a lot of these states. If they don't, we're gonna have to reschedule the the date to a, a, a later time when uh, things cool off a little bit. But as of now, these are open. If you want to grab tickets for these uh, tickets for all these shows, are available right now on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A dot com. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. You guys were uh, this. This was fun. This was a, this was good. We didn't have too many people screaming at each other in the comments section. I I, I like that aspect of it. Uh, and and I uh, you know I hope you got uh something of value from this from this discussion so uh till tomorrow we'll be back tomorrow 4 30 eastern 1 30 pacific uh and uh yeah stay 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 good to each other be good to yourself and we'll see you on the road bye guys <laughs>